Hi everyone, my name is Dr. John Biard, and today I want to talk about the science of breathing for longevity. Yes, thousands of years ago, Ayurveda designed a host of breathing techniques aimed at, you know, an anti-aging longevity benefit. And now we have science to prove exactly how that works. Now I've been teaching breathing techniques uh, since 1987 when I came back from India. And I would always say that these breathing techniques are the most powerful thing that I teach and prescribe, but nobody does them. And I want to explain to you why that happens and hope you get over the hump of not doing these breathing techniques because they're too important not to do. The rib cage has elastic recoil, right? It naturally wants to squeeze down on your heart and your lungs. And to prove that, really simple. Take a big breath in, all the way to the top. Takes a little effort, right? Now let it go. No effort. Exhalation takes zero effort because the rib cage has elastic bands in there called elastic recoil, which squeeze your lungs and uh, your rib cage down to force the air out. <clears throat> so your exhalation is effortless, but your inspiration takes work. And that's done primarily by your good old diaphragm, which is that big muscle across your rib cage that when it contracts, it pulls the air down and sucks air into the lower lobes of your lungs and expands your rib cage 26,000 times per day. But over time, with aging, we know this to be true, the diaphragm gets weak and tired and it doesn't contract completely. It doesn't fully expand the rib cage and the elastic recoil, which is quite strong in the rib cage, starts to win the war and your rib cage becomes tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. Your diaphragm becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. Your diaphragm is the major lymphatic pump to suck lymphatic fluid waste out of your breast tissue for breast cancer, out of your abdominal cavity. It's the number one pump and the lion's share of all the lymph in your body is around your intestinal tract. If that diaphragm is not pumping the way it should, then you're not gonna get all that lymph out of, your, out of your abdominal cavity and all that extra fat and protein that didn't get properly pulled out of the lymph gets stored in the belly and it's one of the major reasons for belly fat. So just so you know that that diaphragm has many, many more reasons to function than just making us breathe. But it is primarily a breathing of inspiration to pull all the air in. Now most of us sit around and we, what? We slouch, and we watch TV, we're on the computer, you know, we're in our car driving. And think about this, the rib cage, your diaphragm, which is right in through here, is supposed to contract and pull air down, right? But if you're slouching, you're already pushing the diaphragm down. It has no place else to go. It's like if I contract my biceps, right? And now you say, John, contract your biceps. I'm going, it's already contracted. So if I slouch, I'm already contracting my diaphragm. So I'm gonna have a hard time breathing, using my diaphragm to breathe air into my lower lobes of my lungs, right? It's gonna be very difficult. So over time, with aging, we know that the diaphragm becomes weaker. Even one study with elite athletes, half of them had premature diaphragmatic fatigue, which means that if half the elite athletes' diaphragm is fatiguing out, then probably you and I have the same issue. So we have to combat sitting, watching TV, and driving, and computering on screen time and all that with breathing exercise. But the reason why people don't do it is because when, you, when I first asked you to breathe into that rib cage, you're like, oh, it's so much effort to get it to open up that you, you have a, almost like an instant wave of fatigue, breathing fatigue, and you're like, I don't want to do this. And I'm telling you, if you just push through that, that, that resistance to do it for the first week, after a week or two of doing it, when that rib cage begins to become elastic again for the first time, like 12 levers now massaging your heart and your lungs 26,000 times a day, pumping lymph waste out of your rib cage and oxygen in, creating elasticity in your spine and your neck and shoulders. All these benefits are very, very real. And after you get that opened up, I promise you, you will look forward to breathing. You're gonna wake up in the morning going, instead of saying, I want my cup of coffee, you mean, I need to go breathe. That's what's gonna happen if you start learning how to do this. Okay, so there's more. That's just the reason why you don't breathe, okay? Because we're gonna do that. So now how do we do it and what's the longevity benefit of breathing anyway? So in Ayurvedic medicine, thousands of years ago, in the book called the Hatha Yoga Pradipika and Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, the two sort of original books on pranayama breathing yoga, they said that if you don't hold your breath 
during a breathing exercise, it's not pranayama. So it's not pranayama unless you do what's called kumbhak or breath retention. That's really interesting because many people are doing all kinds of fancy breathing and they don't do any breath hold at all. And a lot of people are, in a way, afraid of breath holding because we've been told it's sort of bad. And I, and I think you have to be careful with it. And I'm going to give you sort of a beginner program in breath holds today. But I want to first share with you how to, the benefits, the science behind it, so you understand it. So when you um, hold your breath, you, um, you particularly on the exhalation, and that's the only time I'm suggesting to, to, to hold your breath is on the exhalation. So when you hold your breath on the exhalation, your CO2 levels are going to rise. So you breathe in on the inhalation, you take a whole bunch of oxygen in, it's gonna take a while for you to use up that oxygen before your CO2 levels would rise. So if you breathe out all the way and then hold your breath, CO2 levels will begin to rise. And something called the Bohr effect is that when the CO2 levels rise, the oxygen in your blood attached to your hemoglobin molecule is released from the hemoglobin and it dumps all the oxygen to your tissues, to your brain, to your nervous system. And it increases um, all types of cellular benefit. A lot of us, as we age, we don't breathe as efficiently and our cells become hypoxic. They don't have as much oxygen. Mutagenic cell stem cells begin to proliferate. We have cellular damage, cellular proliferation that's out of whack and out of balance. We degenerate, we go, oh, the body breaks down. And this is why we understand aging. We get tired as you age, your metabolism slows down, you gain weight, you, you, you can't sleep as well, you get stiff and achy, um, your blood sugar goes up. All these things are due to, in one way or another, hypoxia. And the regulator of hypoxia is something called AMPK, which means adenosine monophosphate activated kinase, which is an enzyme to make sure that your body is constantly being delivered the amount of oxygen it needs to the, to the mitochondria in your cells to deliver the right amount of energy. And studies show that as we age, our AMPK goes down. It's one of the kind of the holy grail agents of longevity research is AMPK. And there's a handful of ways to boost your AMPK. Ashwagandha is an AMK, AMPK booster. Green tea is an AMPK booster. Well, so is breathing. Breathing with breath holes have been shown to extend longevity. And one of the mechanisms for that is boosting AMPK to make sure that you don't have the age-related decline in the delivery of your oxygen to your cells so your cells become hypoxic. So hypoxia in your cells is bad, right? But a little bit of hypoxia somehow triggers the body to wake up and drive that oxygen in and repair and rebuild even more efficiently, right? So we know that uh, calorie restriction, uh, fasting, when you don't eat for a short period of time, triggers Nobel Prize winning uh, science called autophagy, cellular repair, recycling, and rejuvenation. Um, and, and so we know when our ancestors uh, you know, didn't get enough food, cells live longer, they make more energy. We thrive when we don't have food in a way to get the body that extra energy to go hunt and find what it needs before you die. In the same way, if you fell off a cliff and broke all your ribs, you're not gonna die but you're not gonna breathe very well for a while. And you could go into a state of hypoxia, which would then trigger an emergency alarm bell. All the repair molecules would come rushing to the site. And that's called intermittent hypoxia. Different than chronic extended hypoxia, which is bad and happens when you age, caused by low MPK, AMPK, but in intermittent hypoxia is something that you get when you hold your breath. And that's called Kumbach. And it was discovered and talked about over 2,500 years ago, written about at least that long. And it's been now shown to increase AMPK, increase longevity, and also increase autophagy, which is pretty cool. So the breath holding, what happens when you actually do the breath hold is the body starts to, the CO2 levels begin to rise. And then during that period of time, the, the, all the blood in your oxygen gets dumped into your tissue. So if you took an oximeter, which I encourage you to buy, which is a little measurement of the oxygen saturation in your blood. Your watch will go from 98% saturated oxygen. As you hold your breath, it'll go down to the low 90s. And if you do a, another round of breathing and a kumbak or a breath hold, it'll go down into the 80s and then maybe even into the 70s. And anything in the 80s 
is intermittent hypoxia. So when you're in that place and you can look on the monitor, I'm sorry, and look on the monitor and you will know that you're getting all these incredible benefits. And I've written a bunch of articles on intermittent hypoxia. This is the first time I've talked about AMPK in relation to the breathing, so I want you to know that there's articles you can go to and shows that intermittent hypoxia with Kumbach increased stem cells, nitric oxide, Nobel Prize winning panacea molecule, it increases uh, what EPO, uh, what Lance Armstrong got busted for injecting, EPO, another hormone, protects your genes, lowers blood sugar, lowers blood pressure, changes neuroplasticity of your brain so you don't do the same old emotional stuff again and again and again. This is why breathing was so important because it was a key piece of Ayurveda to make us conscious, right? And most of us walk around unconscious. We do 95% of the stuff we think and say and do in our day comes from impressions we experienced and memorized from the first five or six years of life. That's unconscious. So everybody's like, we can't be doing that. We need to become conscious. So they use breathing techniques to change the brainwave pattern. So the brainwave became more aware, self-aware of what's real and what's not real. And what's not real are a lot of the emotions that we, that we uh, react to and respond to and from, which don't serve us a lot of the time, right? So it's kind of a really interesting understanding. The benefits are, are, are amazingly diverse, right? But from the longevity perspective we're talking about, it's really important to understand that the breath hold gives you a little bit more of this AMPK. Why? When you hold your breath, the body goes, whoa, I'm not getting the oxygen that I need. All the oxygen leaving my blood, my blood levels are going down. That's hypoxia. That's the state of hypoxia. That triggers the emergency bells, stem cells kick in, uh, all the uh, rejuvenative autophagy kicks in, more AMPK kicks in, uh, blood sugar levels stabilize, the body goes into this emergency repair mode just to get you out of that state. So we've been, our studies, it's quite a fascinating amount of research being done on this because the scientific community is very fascinated by how just a little bit of hypoxia can do this amazing repair where a lot can really cause disease. Similarly, a little bit of calorie restriction can cause amazing repair. A lot of food can cause some real problems, right? And that's what, that's what happens. Okay, so, um, and, and, and just breathing techniques alone. Uh, they did a study with, uh, they did a study with um, people who did, had respiratory cancers, and they measured their five and 10 year survival rates. And they gave half the group, um, a morning breathing exercise for about an hour a day, and the other group didn't. They followed them for 10 years. The, in the first five years, the group that did the, uh, the uh, morning breathing exercises had a, had a 56% uh, survival rate compared to a 19% survival rate. In the second five years, they noticed that the ability for them to hold their breath longer started to significantly increase. And with that significant increase of breath holding time in the second five years, in the 10 year survival rate, there was a 17 fold increase survival rate with the uh, morning breathing exercise group compared to the group that didn't do the exercise. By, and, the, and, the, and the research showed that they, they, they think and they suggest that, that the cause of that was because of the ability to extend the breath. And what happens when you extend the breath? A whole bunch of really cool things. CO2 levels rise, you build what called CO2 tolerance, it means you're not always having to breathe again really shallow like we do as we get older, little tiny breaths, and all of a sudden all that oxygen in your blood gets dumped into your tissues and it does cellular repair. Pretty cool stuff. So how do you get started with this? Really simple. You can just do one of my favorite breathing techniques, which is called Ujjayi breathing, where you just take a, it's called an ocean breath, where you constrict the glottis in the back of your mouth and you make a sort of a snoring sound, Darth Vader sound, something like this. If you could do a five to six second inhale, and a five to six second exhale, and do that for about five minutes. Just get into that rhythm, it's sort of a magic rhythm. If you're naturally and comfortably able to do it even a little slower than that, make breaths a little longer than that, that's fine. But you want about a six breaths per minute pace. Then, after you about six breaths per minute, then after about six minutes of that, you can start to, as you go on and take your exhale, don't force it out, breathe in,
and hold. Another two, three, four, five, six counts, whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. This has to be comfortable. And then as soon as you, you then after three, you know, three, four, five, six seconds, take another inhale, six seconds in, six seconds out of two to six second exhale breath hold. It's called the Bahi Kumbak, a Kumbak on the exhalation. And Kumbak on the exhalation builds CO2 faster. CO2 is a sedative molecule. It actually calms and relaxes your nervous system. Different than hold <gasps> breath on the inhale, that activates oxygen, which is a stimulating molecule and creates more, uh, more activation in this situation we want to calm us down. And that's how you can start. And if that feels comfortable, read my article called Strengthen Your Lungs Now, Pratiloma, another breathing technique where I go into detail about how you can do uh, a little bit more uh, advanced um, pranayama breathing with the kumbak and breath hold. Really important stuff. Like I said, the beginning, you're just not gonna wanna breathe into that rib cage, but um, with practice within a week or two, particularly with the pratiloma breathing, in the Strengthen Your Lungs Now Pratiloma article on my website at lifespa.com, you will see uh, what I'm talking about because it's a little effortful to breathe into that, into that rib cage. And the same thing when I teach my one minute meditation, which you type in one minute meditation on my website and you'll read about an article called using Bastrika, the bellows breath, followed by 30 breaths, followed by just closing your eyes and meditating. And again, the resistance to doing that just for 30 breaths is sometimes overwhelming for folks. So I can't emphasize enough that if you just stick with it, all of a sudden you'll have that elasticity back in your rib cage. And of course, yoga, Surya Namaskar, are, are all part of the equation uh, to create that rib cage elasticity and the ability to drive the prana, the life force, the oxygen, into the deep tissues. So you have, you know, the, the, you have the, the, the right amount, ample amount of the AMPK driving you know, the production of ATP, uh, uh, oxygen, energy from your cells in every single cell of your body. All right, thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Gary. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.